Welcome back inside the Section 925 Pod Center. We are happy for the, 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 this Art and Wine Festival got crowded. If the guys were here earlier, there wasn't much of a crowd here. Boy, it's a, a hot day and a very crowded day out here. We're happy to have Matt Keeperman, coach at Camp Luna High School football team, and Jacob Westfall, quarterback at Camp Luna High School. Guys, welcome inside the Pod Center. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, last night, you guys played uh, Oakdale. Uh, and uh, it was a, I thought it was a great game. I mean, it was a tough game. Uh, Oakdale, a lot of straight ahead running. Uh, eventually wore Campo down, it felt like. Uh, a lot of run up the middle. What did you guys see in that game? We'll start here and we'll kind of work our way backwards. What did you see at halftime? What did you guys talk about in terms of trying to make an adjustment to deal with Oakdale? Trying to get the uh, kids in the weight room for another two months. <laughs> <laughs> on the field. Um, the, uh, there wasn't much of an adjustment as far as the kids were playing hard. They, they had held Oakdale to 14 points. Um, we, we did try and get one extra body to the line of scrimmage, but there wasn't much to do other than just convince the kids to stick with what we had. Sometimes the these guys are bigger and, and pretty fast. I mean, I got number two. I, I must have called his name 80 times, but uh, I can't remember it now. But uh, fantastic runner. I mean, this guy was great through the lines. It was unbelievable. Jacob, it, at some point it became pretty apparent that Oakdale was going to shut down the run and we were going to have to go on the passing attack. How did that impact how you were going to play the game? Well, obviously it helps. My, it makes my job a lot easier when we're able to run the ball and spread it out. Um, but, you know, watching the field attack the week, you know, that their secondary wasn't as strength of theirs. They play in a league where a lot of teams are very similar to them. Um, you know, a lot of, they face a lot of runs. They weren't used to uh, heavy passing attack. So I was I was really prepared to come out there. Um, I had watched a lot of film during the week. I kind of knew what they were going to do defensively. And I came out there with the mentality to attack the secondary. And I was really proud of how our receivers played and how we were able to get that done. Uh, I thought you, you guys played very well. Uh, it, it was impressive. But for one kind of unlucky tipped ball, it resulted in an interception. Uh, maybe that game turns out a little bit differently. Uh, you, you mentioned, Jacob, that uh, the teams that, that they normally face, Oakdale, are sort of similar to them. And we talked about this a little bit before the podcast, that uh, uh, when you grow up playing Pop Warner, that's what you do. You want a straight ahead running, and that's kind of what we saw last night. But you didn't, neither of you did, neither did I, grow up playing Pop Warner. Um, you bring this up a lot at section925.com, the impact of MOL football. How do you think MOL football prepared you for playing high school tackle football? Well, I think MOL is one of the better organi sports organizations that we have in probably the entire Bay Area. Uh, it does a really good job of just getting kids into the basics of football in general and uh, allowing them to know that football is more than just a game, how they're able to gain bond with people on their team and just making friendships. Uh, a lot of the kids who don't play football at Campo don't come from a pop one background and um, clearly we've still been successful without that where a lot of people think a lot of these other teams are growing up, like you said, like you know, playing pop one and just running the same offense and center really young. Um, so I think just the idea of having fun with football and making an idea about hanging out with your buddies is one of the best things that everyone can do for you. Matt, as a coach, what do you see the difference between the kids that grow up playing MOL and Pop Warner? For us, it's a development of a skill set that can't be... It's hard to develop at the high school level if they don't come in with a certain background from multiple kids throwing the ball and catching the ball and moving around in space where Pop Warner can look like a rugby scrum a lot of the time. MOL football allows kids in space and allows us at a freshman level to, even though our linemen have never been in contact against another team until game one, uh, to be competitive right off the bat because they can throw in pads, they can run in space, and it, it, train, it, it then goes to the JV level it, and obviously the varsity level. It's a big reason why a team like us or even Naramani over the last 10, 15 years with, without Division I bodies all the time, rarely ever, uh, have competed at a very high level. And you said rarely, if ever, in the last couple of years, there have been some Division One bodies that have come through Campo, but that was rare. It, it, it's not it's not normal for Campo to have guys that go and play Division One football. Okay, this is my 20th year. Uh, we have had only two kids play a snap 
Well, in a Division One level that got a full ride out of high school was a quarterback, Nick Graziano, and then the current tight end at uh, USC. Um, but the guys who do get scholarships are skill position players. And it's a, uh, a big testament to what an NFL does. It develops position players. The, you know, the, even the kids that have walked on and played snaps are playing safety. Um, and kickers have gotten scholarships, but I am going to leave them out of the equation for the point of this conversation. <laughs> I, I don't believe it. Um, you know, we talked about we talked about um, the recent history of Camp uh, and how much success in the last five years to go to the state championship three times. It's unprecedented, I think, for any school, uh, let alone Camp Lido, to do that. Um, but you've been with the program for 20 years. Talk a little bit about what the program was like 20 years ago when you started and how, how we got to where we are today. Where we started 20 years ago, we fielded my first year coaching. We had 20, a little over 20 on the JV team. They had never won a game as freshmen. Um, won two games as a JV team and let varsity out winning a ton of games. But established you know, it was the start to establish a foundation of what the team concept is. And, and it's not to try and get cliche, but the first probably eight years are spent just building that foundation so that when the kids leave, they care about each other. And what do you say? Wins make the kids care about each other, the kids care and make the wins. They both rely on each other. Um, but to get to where it is now, I have two other alumni on our staff. We never, ever expected uh, to have Camp Olinda be mentioned among state champ title contenders. Or if you went down to Southern California and were wearing a Camp Olinda shirt, they go, oh, that, yeah, we saw you guys on TV. We saw you guys playing or rolling the same breath with, you know, it's not to say Bay LaSalle, but that same type of success. Or you go down to LA, it's like, oh, we saw St. John Bosco and then at Bay LaSalle, and then we saw you playing. It's, 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 it's a lot of fun, you know, it's a little bit. Yeah, it, it, I'm sure it's hard to describe. I want to jump back to 2014 uh, because there was such a monumental end to that season. Camp Lando ends up in the, ends up in the state championship game uh, against Al Capitan of, of San Diego. Jacob, you were on that team, right? And um, you were on the sidelines for that game. Uh, and, I talked to Tito Garcia about that about a week ago, about what he was thinking about when, when that happened and, and when the, the fumble was recovered. Being on the sidelines, you guys are both on the sidelines in that game. What's going through your mind when Campo's down 28-7? What, what are you thinking? Well, I mean, you're inevitably thinking, oh no, this game's done. You know, we fought hard. What can we, what else can we do? And when that happens, it was one of the crazy moments of my entire life. Just everyone jumping up and down. It was, it was so surreal that everything almost just went blank and we didn't really know what was happening. Um, and then when the reality kind of kicked in after the game of what had just happened, uh, all the madness and the craziness and the, just the unlikeliness of that play, for that play to happen, um, it was just really incredible and an incredible experience to be part of. Matt, what was going through your mind at, at 28-7 and, let me ask you this, 28-7 and 28-14 and 28-21 and 28-28, what do you think? At 28-7, I was talking with our offensive coordinator. We were looking at the play sheet of which way do we go from here because they run into a run and, 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 and we're getting shut down. And our quarterback came to the sideline or found us on the sideline before taking the field. He goes, guys, remember when we used to score like 35 points in a quarter and a half in league? Why don't we just do that again? And we immediately scrapped our playbook and we just went to four or five on those basic plays. And all of a sudden, it was, they started clicking. And it was one of those moments where you realize as a coach, too, you get so caught up in the moment of, let's make it perfect, we got to do this, you got to overreact to that. And it was, oh yeah, we're actually good. We got here because we deserve to get here. Look what we do. Let's do what we do. And make them stop us. It, it was a testament to, uh, to Jack Stevens for enlightening Chris Schofield and I. But that's what it was. The play calling got simple. And went back to the plays that we made 
and you watch 28-14 and you can feel the momentum turn because our, our defense had played great. It was special team players, led to a couple touchdowns. It wasn't really, we weren't getting gashed by defense. Our defense was playing solid and sure enough we get a stop, get them off the field, right back out. Three or four simple basic play calls that have been part of every game. We're in the end zone again. All right, guys. Another stop, we're in the end zone. Now, when it was 28-28 and they were driving, I was definitely, the momentum, momentum did, uh, that field did go away. That's what I wanted to ask you about, was uh, when it got back to 28-28, and now they're driving the field. Four little over four minutes left in the game, and they're driving all the way down to the 10-yard line. Oh no, there's 50 seconds left, we came back and tied it. They're gonna win this, we're gonna lose this game after all. Is that what's going through your mind? It was absolutely going through our mind because we had two timeouts, but they were going to be able to bleed the clock to kick with, you know, whether they wanted to kick with five seconds, four, three, two, or one. The field goal should have been the last play of the game, and they had a very capable field goal kicker. So it was, yeah, it, you know, it was, and it was out of your hands as a coach. I mean, at that point, it was, there's nothing you can do to change them from kicking the field goal in the last play of the game. They could have taken the lead and just waited to kick, but they, whether they were trying to put the ball in the middle of the field, they wanted to put, you know, whatever they wanted to do, um, our kids, you know, made a play. I mean, just an incredible play, the helmet on the football, and then for the ball to bounce right to, to Adam Ramodo, and for him to have a convoy to the end zone, it was uh, definitely delirium. Certainly a moment to, to remember, um, and, and a crazy confluence of, of, of factors that came in to allow that play to happen. Um, you know, after you have that kind of an experience and you come back in 2015, really another remarkable run to get back to state. Uh, Jacob, at that point, you're playing full-time quarterback and a junior uh, and get back to state. Going into that season last year, did you have any plans to go back to state or that's so far out of your mind what were you think um i wouldn't plans would not be uh the right way to describe it but more of just kind of a dream um to watch that to watch what happened in 2014 and be inspired by those guys to think wow I mean, it's incredible experience to be part of this and be able to help the practice squad and be the backup on the sidelines but then to actually go and do it yourself um it's just a whole separate thinking and experience. Uh, I found a lot of comfort behind our massive offensive line last year and Max Flower and Madison Young obviously you know when I was I had some games where I struggled and often they would fade me out with some great plays. Um, and I have to be thankful for them for that because I think without the offensive line, those two guys especially, um, it would have been it would have been a much different year. We wouldn't have gone back to that same same opportunity. Well, you knew coming into this year, let's let's go ahead to this year, 2016. You lost a couple big, big guys. One starting started playing Yale you know, this year on the offensive line. Uh, you don't have the line that you had. Has that changed your game plan? It's changed our game plan tremendously. I mean, first we are, you know, we're having to face now. We were turned down by 29 teams in the Bay Area for games during the preseason this year. From the private schools, we tried to schedule up north. We tried to schedule bigger schools in the North Bay, along the peninsula, um, even moving out east. But 29 teams said no to us. So these kids have now gotten forced into, and it, it's not to say, oh, we're small and have to play big teams, because it happens. It's going to happen throughout the course of the season. But the, we don't have the depth, and neither do any local school when you've got 1,200 kids to go week after week after week of facing teams that are, you know, 60 kids on the sideline and, you know, just physically. It's, 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 it's a matter of physics. Um, so the game planning has had to change. Um, we, we knew we were small against the line. We've asked a couple kids to, 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 to give up their dreams of playing other positions to play the line and they, they've done it um, and their effort is never an answer but if a kid that's 160 has perfect technique and a kid that's 220 has perfect technique 220 wins it just, it just wins um, but the one thing that we had accounted for to a degree because Jake's now a senior and he's grown but the exponential growth in the last four weeks now from, from Jake 
from the receiving core, and especially some junior receivers, uh, Vincent Masati, John Torgio, even Mike Garcia, who only played limited snaps last year as a junior. And but guys have compensated in other ways, and going forward, the way Jake has grown and the plays he's made over the last three weeks um, is, is, is going to play to our advantage. It, it, and it's, it's how game planning wise has given us just a, a much bigger package to play with. Well, I'll, I'll say, at the risk of embarrassing you, you stuck in last night and took some pretty vicious hits and you saw them coming. And so maybe that's a little bit what you, you weren't facing that last season. And that's, that's one thing that's changed this year is you got to take a little bit more of a beating. How are you feeling? Uh, right now I'm feeling a little sore, um, but you know, I was actually incredibly proud of how hard our offensive line fought. Um, I actually thought, I was, I don't want to say I was surprised with how much time I had last night to throw the ball, but I was, I was satisfied with it. Um, last night, or last year, I actually got a little bit too greedy. I remember the first couple of games, I was just be sitting in the pocket for <laughs> six, seven seconds, and the coach was going, throw the ball, throw the ball, but I, I was able to hold on to it just because I had this pocket around me where I was where I was able to wait and let the play develop. And obviously this year it's different. Uh, that's not a it's not an insult to our line, but more of a comment on the teams that we're playing. Um, I so after last night I was I was just proud of how our offensive line fought. Like Keith was saying, our starting right guard is 160 pounds with great technique at the end of the day. 160 pounds with great technique is not gonna beat the guy crossing him with 220. Um, but like I keep saying, I was just so proud of how they fought and never gave up and just with the overall effort that those guys put in to protect them. So let's talk about the season thus, thus far. Uh, Campo stands now at 2-2. Two two. Uh, first game of the season with Valley Christian. Uh, a loss that was 21-7, but um, I'll be honest, it could have been 35-0 if it weren't a couple of turnovers. Right? It was a big, tough, fast team to play. You, you, you alluded to it, or you said it already. You tried to stand over teams and 2019 turned you down. Why about that for a second? Why are they turning you down? It's simply because they don't want the loss? There's a, a couple things. The, the loss, uh, yes, is definitely one of them. Um, in the new system, though, that CIF and North Coast has established is this system where it, it, one, we don't know what we're playing for. We used to know you play for North Coast 